Gagong. The sound the bedroom door makes when your wife finds out that your idea of a perfect anniversary gift is the collector's edition of Suburbia. Also the name of a hot game by the Game Brewer. Gagong, also the Chinese name for the palace inside the forbidden city Beijing, where in the old days you could bribe officials to do literally anything, like marry a dead person. Google it, it's a thing. But there is a new emperor in town and the time for corruption is over. We are done with it, punishable by death. The officials still want to get overcompensated for their work, so they started the latest trend, gift swapping. I give you some wooden chopsticks and you give me the big box edition of Kingdom Builder. Now, because my gift is worth more, because it totally is, you now let me do whatever action you provide. This is the basic game mechanic of Gugong. You will win a game of Gugong by having the most victory points at the end of four days. And although that sounds like a very long game, it will feel like 20 minutes per player. You will get those victory points during the game, but also a bunch of them at the end. A day looks like this. It starts with the morning phase, which is depicted very nicely on the top of the main board. And it is also depicted on the player boards as well. It starts with determining the start player. At the beginning of the game, it is whatever convoluted way you want to mitigate the starting player. But then during the game, it can change because someone who grabs this next start player token will become the next start player. And this, the morning phase, is where that change happens afterwards. That token is put back onto the board for someone else to grab it for the next day. After that, we refill the board. We'll put some more travel tokens on the board if the spots are empty whatever that is, and we roll the dice of destiny. 65% of our life is ruled by destiny. 35% by willful action. What those destiny dice do, I will tell you a little bit later. Two more things to cover during the morning phase. If someone has acquired a perk, a decree, a technology, or whatever you'd like to call it, there are two of them that give you a bonus in the morning phase. Well, this is the moment to check that out. And the last one is you get servants. Yes, you get servants. Six of them during day one. During day two, three, and four, you get four each. Let's get to the meat of the game, the day phase. On your turn, you will play one of your gift cards and exchange them with one of the gift cards on the board. If you offer a gift that is of a higher value than the one that is on the board, you will get to perform the action. You successfully bribed that official and he will do the action for you. But that will not always be the case. So there are some ways to work around it. First off, you could give up two of your servants. If you give them up, you get to perform that action. Or you can use one of the unused gift cards and just discard them on your own discard pile. This is another way of doing an action, although your card is not of a high enough value. Last thing you could do is, well, just play a card that is of a lesser value and not perform the action. There is one exception to this rule, and that is the Fruit Bowl, which has a value of one. The Fruit Bowl can trump the nine card. Because, well, of course I can see how healthy fruit is worth more than dying young and unhealthy, but with loads of gold. What are those location actions? There are seven different ones, and here they are in a weird arbitrary order. First up, the Jade Market. Here you can buy your jades. You pay for them with the servants you have at your disposal. Now, the gems will get more expensive and not get replenished during the morning phase, so it's just like getting German rolls at the bakery. Get them early or it will just not be worth it. 
The second area is the decree area. Here you'll be able to get a bonus, a perk, a technology kind of that will help you during the game. The first two will give you a bonus at the morning phase. The second two are a bit more expensive, but they give you a, a perk when you do a certain action. And the last two are bonus points at the end of the game. The game box comes with loads of different perks and you always use two of each level during the game. You will pay for each degree the amount of servants that is printed on them and one extra servant for each opponent servant that is already present. And then you will need another servant to mark that you can actually do it. So these servants are important to have. In case that was not clear until now, servant cubes that are not on your player board are not yours to spend. They are yours to gain at different moments. But please note that all cubes you use to do certain actions will need to come from your own servant pool. I mean, come on, you have servants, now don't start whining that you don't have enough servants. The third area is the travel area. Yes, everyone has their own travel token. And when you perform the travel action, you get to move your traveler one or two spaces. One is the basic action, but if you spend two more servants, you get to move twice. Each movement point will let you move to a connecting travel token and you can jump over empty spaces and over opponents as well. The tokens are immediate bonuses like gaining servant cubes or even getting some of those cooler actions. The back of the rulebook gives you a great overview here. The tokens do not get discarded, no, you collect them at the top of your player board. And at any point you can discard those and get an additional bonus gain a servant, get some points, or even get a jade. Then we are at the intrigue location. Here you are able to move up on this intrigue track. This track determines how ties are broken in the game. The player who is in front or on top will break the tie in their favor. Not only at the end of the game, but also during other moments, which I will explain later. You can get one step and claim the next start player marker, or you can spend a servant to take three steps. Yes, that arrow has three steps on them. Next up is a very important one if you want to win the game. The Palace of Heavenly Purity. You will need to get your envoy marker all the way to the top to be able to compete for the win. If you don't make it, you are out, zero points. First player to make it to the top will get more points at the end of the game and any steps you will receive beyond that will give you an extra point as well. If you pay two servants, you will get two steps, but also gain a step on the intrigue track. Number six, the Great Wall. Here you get to participate in the building of a piece of the Great Wall. Depending on how many players you are playing, you are trying to fill up a piece of that wall. You can add one of your servants there or pay one servant and add two of your servants to the wall. If a section wall is filled up, you will immediately do a great wall scoring. The person who has participated most and in case of a tie, the tie goes to whoever is in front on the intrigue track. That person will get three points and one step on the palace of heavenly purity track. Only the cubes of the person who just got the points for it are removed from the wall. And now everyone who was involved in building this part gets to cash in steps on the intrigue track into either cubes, jades, or even get to change the value of those dice of destiny. Destiny is the force that controls the things that happen in your life. The last location is the Grand Canal. You may add a servant to one of your ships, which will magically appear on the first free harbor space on the Grand Canal. And then you may move your ship one step, jumping over occupied harbors. You could also choose to pay a servant and fill up two spaces of one of your boats. You're allowed to have multiple boats on the canal. In a four and five player game, there are two of these canals and you can always choose which one you will use. If one of your boats is filled up, you can unload and gain the benefit of the harbor you are at. The first one gives you four victory points. The second one will give you a bonus card that can function as an extra action card, an extra gift card, so that's amazing to have. And the last one is a double worker, which is great to have. 
Using a double worker can fill up your boats quicker, it will benefit you when you're building the walls, but also count as two workers when you need to pay for something. Whichever reward you choose, you need to put one of the cubes from the boat next to your player board. And now you will notice that you will only be able to take that double servant once, the extra action space bonus twice, and the four point bonus thrice. So that are the location actions you can take, but you can get more actions. If you exchange a card, you put the card you receive on your own personal discard pile. These will be the cards you'll be working with next round. Pretty smart, huh? But the card you put on the board might have another action on it. You get to perform that action before you do the location action. And this lets you manipulate and do multiple things in one turn. Sometimes you get to do an extra action, sometimes you get servant cubes, or maybe you can swap out cards on the board. Loads of cool stuff. You'll switch and alternate turns until every player has put all their cards on their discard pile. And then we'll start with the night phase. In the night phase we will give out some points, but mostly we will see what happens with those dice of destiny. Oh. Destiny is what you will end up getting, which will be in proportion to what you rightfully deserve at that juncture. It is a mix of your fruits and past actions, suitably modified by divine grace, based on your true motives, sincerity, honest efforts, and hard work. All players reveal their discard pile of gift cards and see if the numbers on them correspond with those dice of destiny. You will get a bonus servant for each time that happens. The person who matches up the most will gain three points and one step on the Palace of Heavenly Purity track. Also, all ships on the Great Canal will move one space and you're able to unload now in the new harbor if your ship was full. Should your ship now sail off the end of the board, then it's lost at sea and the contents will go back into your general supply. That's it, that is one day. You play four of these days during the game of Gugong and we only have to do end of game scoring. At end of game scoring, there are four things we need to do. First off, we'll do another great wall scoring. The person who still has the most leftover servants on the great wall will now also receive the bonus of three points and one step on the track of Palace of Heavenly Purity track. Poof. If you have not made it to the top of that track by now, you're out of the game. You get zero points, niente, nada, nopus, because you need to get there, get to the top of the track. You will also now receive the bonuses you got when you got to the top of the track with the first person getting the most points and will also resolve the points you get for the two decrees that will give you points at the end of the game. Well, this is the end of the game, so you get those points right now. And the last thing is you have to count up the jades and see how many points those jades that you've gathered will bring you. That's it. The person with the most points has won the game of Gugong, and if it's a tie, the person who is highest or furthest on the intrigue track will have taken the win. Is Gugong a good game? Yes, it definitely is. There are multiple paths to victory. There's no one road that is really overpowered. There is, well, I do feel that getting that double worker is, is somewhat of a have to because uh, you get so many bonuses and there are so many ways of getting that double worker back onto your player board. You can get it back through the intrigue track or just go traveling and, and get another servant back. So there are loads of ways, uh, almost to a point where I thought we need to check in the rule book if we're doing this right because it's so powerful. But uh, apparently we're doing everything the way we're supposed to. The game scales very well. It's like 20 to 25 minutes per player. I think that is a good amount of time. And it's not too long, especially in a four or five player. There's a solo mode for the game. I have not tried it yet, but it's definitely a possibility. Uh, when you play with a two or three players, you're mostly able to build on your own cards. The board will not change that much between rounds when it's your turn. But in a four or five player game, the board will have changed significantly. So you're not really 
able to plan ahead. You're mostly adapting to the new situation when it comes back to you, which is good, but it's also uh, harder because yeah, you, you cannot really plan ahead. On the other hand, spots that you thought were going to be unavailable to you might become available if someone else kind of takes the hit and puts down a, a lower card for you to, to then build again on. So interaction is not that much, mostly looking at, please don't do that, oh no, why are you doing that? So that's, that's the player interaction for you. The components are nice. There is a deluxe version out there that supposedly is all the bomb. So if you want to find that one, you might want to check that out. You can still bling this one, get an Ayers. I could get some marbles instead of those jade tokens. But the deluxe version, it has it all. So this is all good and all fine. I do feel that I will not be playing this game as much. There are other games that I'd like to get to the table more. I want to play Underwater Cities. I've got expansions for Terraforming Mars I haven't gotten into. I want to play those games. Uh, this one will not get to the table as much. When I first heard of the theme, I thought, yes, amazing having those cards. And then um, the idea is better than the way it turned out. I, it's not the fault of the game because the, the game is nice the way it is, but I, I'm i spoiled. I've got so many games here. I can, I can play whatever I want and I don't feel this one will come to my table uh, that, that much. I, I don't think I'll keep it in my collection. The components are great. I've, I've talk, talk, talked about it. I like it that the, the player board has all the infos on it. The, the main board has all the infos on it. So that really helps making this game easy to understand, make it a gateway game into the world of a little bit more difficult uh, games. So I applaud it for that. I like the theme. I like the story behind it. I like to tell people as well. And, and everyone immediately understands how it works. You've got your gift cards in your hand. You want to put down uh, higher numbers than are on the board so you can perform the actions. So it all, it all works and it flows. It's not going to be in my top 10 of games though, but yeah, very few games do. Thanks for watching. My name is Dave Lusa, and for more board gaming nonsense, check out our podcast, This Game is Broken, a board gaming panel show where a bunch of idiots are getting a bunch of idiotic things to do. Bye, everyone. Over on Board Game Geek, user Dystopian thought of a nice variant on the Palace of Heavenly Purity track, where you're not competing to be the first person to make it to the top, but trying to be the last person to make it to the top. But of course, you still need to make it. So it makes it a, a bit more exciting, makes it more like yeah, a race for, for last place, but still finishing. I, I, I really like that idea and I'm sure gonna try it the next time I'm playing Gugong.